Sportsman TV, early summer bass fishing on the best kept secret on the planet, Toledo Bend. Everybody knows it as a springtime lake. You can come here in the summertime and pretty much have thousands of acres to yourself. If it looks a little foggy out here this morning, basically what happened was that camera spent the night in a snowmaker. Uh, Jared decided that we needed the air conditioner down on snowmaker last night, so I woke up this morning with frost in my, you can tell a little bit of white right here. That's frost in my beard. Like it was so cold in there, I was like this. Like last night sleeping. And that bed had a sheet on it and a, I was like, man, I need a big old, it wouldn't have been too bad if I'd have had some cover on the bed. And you know, the other thing that I like about Toledo Bend this time of the year, where is everybody? You come over in February and March and every boat route's loaded. You come over in the summertime and why they quit fishing, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's just peaceful over here in the summer. There's nobody over here. You know, you see a handful of boats, but, you know, and the fishing, you know, honestly, is not quite as good now as it is, say, uh, you know, February and March, but it's still good. And it's, it's actually just, you know, it's a good time to catch a really big one too. They live here. <laughs> There's more than one. That's been a little slow this morning. I like to hurry up and get him off and get another one back in there just in case he might have a, he might have a friend. You know, the biggest reason for coming over to Toledo Bend this time of the year, say, except for just coming in the spring, is a really unique way of fishing over here that doesn't exist all over the country. It's deep hydrilla. You know, on this lake, you know, typically on a good grass year, the grass is anywhere from 10 foot to 25. And fishing deep grass was really started in this part of the world. Now it's kind of opened up the doors for the whole planet, but this is where deep grass fishing got started. You know, uh, right now I'm just fishing down a, uh, you know, fishing down a grass line. Um, I mean, today we're gonna fish deep brush piles, grass line, drop offs, you know, we're gonna just, we're gonna stay deep and, and fish structure. You know, it's considered, you know, offshore structure. Like when I'm working down that grass, I've got map on one side of my uh, the ranch unit and on the other side, you know, the sonar. And the instant I get bit, I mark that spot. Those fish are there for a reason. Like when you find them on a place, especially this is natural bottom, there's something there they like. I can't see it with my eyes, you know, but so I really uh, make sure, you know, I mark them. Like I just caught the one there so far. I know there's a big group of fish there. And uh, that fish was not real aggressive. I was a little surprised, it bit real light. I thought it was gonna be a small, uh, you know, a smaller fish. So what I'll do, you know, you can just run back and, and hit them. And different times of the day, will fire them up. Or maybe you pull up there one time and you get one of them to bite and it fires the, uh, you know, fires the whole school. Actually, last year I had an opportunity to fish an Elite Series event here uh, early June. And uh, though the, the, it was a really, really good grass year last year, with tons of grass on the lower end of the lake. And, um, I, you know, I actually finished fourth. I, you know, felt like I might have had the opportunity or was around the school of fish, you know, to maybe have a shot at winning. But it's just for me, you know, fishing that deep grass is a confidence thing. It's, uh, I got, I won my first BASS tournament fishing that way. So, you know, it's, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's an emotional way for me to fish, but it's really what I like to do. It's a, it's very personal, one-on-one -on -one combat with the fish, a uh, big line, big pole, uh, gargantuous hook sets. I mean, it, it's a violent way to fish. And I, you know, I'm not saying I'm a violent person, but I like that. It's gonna be like pulling one of them big gags off an old rig when I get bit. You watch. <laughs> it's violent. It seems real peaceful right now, but it's fixing to be, it's fixing to be violent. <laughs> <laughs> 
I promise you it is, because I would rather fish this way than any other way. When it goes down, you know, it's like watching paint dry when you're not catching them, but boy, when it happens, it happens. Yeah, you see a crawfish digging out of his throat. Well, you know, the, the, the best way I can sum up vegetation is if you have an open pasture and you have a, and I'm gonna say a cutover, you know, cause that's a really thick place. That open pasture, you may see an animal or two in it, but that cutover can hide hundreds of animals. Uh, there's a lot of feed, it protects the small ones they hide from predators. So a grass, with, a, a lake with a lot of grass, you know, it protects them from the time they're this big till they're this big. And so even if like a lot of your fish don't live in the grass, a lot of your bait does, or a lot of your young bass, young crappie, young bluegill, whatever the lake may have, it gives the young fish a chance to grow up and get bigger, you know, so they can survive older life, more fish, everybody's happy. You know, after you've been fishing out here all day and it's really, really hot, I like to pick me up a big water hydrilla, wet. Keep it right there on top. Uh, you know, it's actually, and it's an exotic grass, but you know, there's not a bass fisherman in the country that doesn't love the stuff. It, it has a tendency to make the lake better, you know, because it protects the little fish, it protects the bait. You just have a lot more stuff in it. We fished it today as deep as 25 or 26 feet. Depending on how clear the water is, it can grow out to 30 or 35. But uh, I, if you could think about this, you see it, it looks like it's solid, but it's not. Because down towards the bottom, as you can tell, it doesn't have any leaves on it. All the leaves are up towards the top where the sunlight is. So as it grows up, it just opens up underneath. Now when it grows real shallow, a lot of times it's too thick for the fish to get in it. But you know, once it starts to get four or five foot and it just keeps coming, keeps coming, it starts to shade the bottom of it and you don't have any leaves on it. And all this is at the top. So underneath, it's just like a house. It's just a big opening under there. And uh, you know, there are certain places where there are holes and that's where those bass seem to tend to get. They want to get in that hole. So even if you can't see the grass, they still like to get in it. You know, certain times of the year, they're on top of it. You catch them on lipless crankbait, slower on spinnerbait, top water bait over it. And uh, again, I've never been to a lake in the country that's not a great lake that has it. This lake actually has, this is hydrilla, but it has millful, a natural coontail, lily pads, bank grass. I mean, Toledo is loaded with, I mean, it is a target rich environment. It's a solid stump fill with good vegetation and ditches and drains. That's the reason it is one of the top 10 lakes in the country. And within four hours of anybody in the state of Louisiana can beat a Toledo bean. Mm, and it's good too. And I like what I like, I like Thousand Island on it. I'm not big on ranch. It's, 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 it's kind of bitter with ranch, but Thousand Islands, the little Tony Sachets, can't beat it. With a big old fish fillet. Uh, well, you know, the biggest thing about this year, what I like too, they, they, they have a tendency, you know, and they haven't been that long, they've spawned. And when they get out there, typically they're feeding on bluegill. And uh, so I like a jig this time of year. And it also, I feel like, you know, confidence deal, it gives me an opportunity to have a chance at a really big fish. Uh, this is actually an ounce and a quarter hack attack jig. This is the jig I spent most of my time fishing. Uh, and what I like about that, it falls real fast. Those fish are on the bottom through that grass and I really don't want my jig to get hung on top of it. I want it to get right down in there quickly to where they are. I got bit here and I fired them up. One come up and threw up a big old brim, big as my hand. That's what they're eating. Like these fish that live on this kind of stuff right now, you know, they will get, you know, they're fish that are shad eaters. These fish are not eating shad. These are not bait chasers. They lay there and wait for, you know, like the, that jig right there, I'm trying to represent them. Uh, you know, a bluegill, a brim, not a, uh, not a crawfish. Uh, this is a Strike King shell cracker. And again, it, you know, it has a perch-like shape. Uh, you know, you're, you're trying to catch four pound plus fish here this time of the year with, you know, the top end being who knows. I mean, you could literally have a chance here to fish of a lifetime, but they are brim eaters this time of the year. I think it's kind of twofold. That's a, a big food source. And what I mean by that, a big bait, you know, so they, they can fill up quick. But the other thing with that is, I also think that a lot of those bluegill are bedding in that grass bed. So that'll have a tendency to kind of concentrate those fish. I think if you find a hard spot in that grass, you know, those bluegill are bedding there, those bass just kind of concentrate, concentrate that way. Uh, I also think that when, typically when those fish are on the bed, like say bluegills, they're real aggressive, they don't run off. 
Okay, well here you got this big old slow moving bass that swims up there, and here's a bait fish that won't run from him. You know, because that bluegill is being defensive of that bed, he does not stand a chance. I got him. Really? Really? What is that? <laughs> that looks like something you drop on a whole rig. What is that? This is how good I am. <laughs> He's pretty. That's what... You gotta be freaking kidding me. <laughs> That's so horrible. <laughs> I'm like, and it took multiple jerks before I finally got him. Depending on water color is how I kind of, you know, pick the color I'm gonna use. You know, we were dealing this week with real, you know, clear, real pretty water, green. Um, and that's another thing, those bluegill this time of the year, or goggle eye, or perch, you know, whatever it may be. You know, when they get around spawning time, that male is real bright colored, real pretty iridescent colors. Uh, if the water's dirtier, I'll normally throw something with a little chartreuse or a little orange. But when I'm dealing with really, really good water colors like we had this week, I like bright colors. Uh, you know, I like a natural hue but with a lot of metal float. Like uh, this is color actually, it's called Baby Gator. And I got a, uh, a candy crawl, rage crawl on there as a trailer. Um, I start in the morning with more of a purple, just because they see that a little better. And again, it's a color with a, you know, that they see well in the dark, but it has a lot of flash. This is actually peanut butter bug. I do prefer a rage crawl as the trailer on my jig. You know, once the water gets up above 70, and the reason for that, it has a lot of action, has a swimming action. So it actually looks like when you drop that big jig out there and you drop it through that stuff, you know, it looks like it's swimming and shooting through the cover. So we'll have a tendency to fire that bass. He thinks it's something running. Uh, when you pull it up, it swims up like it's getting away. Or when you drop it down, it looks like it's hiding and running to the bottom. So that's something that stimulates them to feed. And a lot of times when you get around a group of fish and you stimulate one, all it takes is to fire one. Once one fires, it kind of excites the whole group. I like 50 pound braid, 30, 50, 65 pound braid. Uh, you can get by with big monofilament or fluorocarbon, but the only problem with that, those fish will snub you up in that grass and you won't be able to get them out. So that's what I like about braid. You know, if you get that big one on there, he, he's got a better chance of getting off if he gets hung up. Now I use a long rod. This is my eight foot flipping stick and uh, I can control a lot of line with it. So. You know, pretty much 20 foot or shallow, I can get enough slack in it without having to pull. But, you know, when we're fishing out 20, 25, I have to, uh, you know, I'll feed some line. I, you know, I, I get as much slack in there as I can on the pitch, and then, uh, and then see, I throw that bow in there, and that throws a bunch of slack. And so I just try to keep plenty slack in that line so that jig is falling real natural. And honestly, I'm not being very versatile right now. I'm fishing the way I want to fish. If I, but there are places here I could be dragging a Carolina rig, you know, throwing a 6XD or a 10XD, a swim bait, you know, dragging a football jig. It just depends on how you want to fish. I mean, Toledo Ben's got it all. We could be frog in the bank today. If I catch a fish and he has a crawfish in his mouth, if there's any way possible for me to get a piece of it out so I can look at the color, because I want to match it exactly. It's a lot easier to, to trick them on something that looks exactly like what they're feeding them rather than forcing them to eat something that, you know, I'm not eating that right now. You know, a bass is an opportunist. I'm not saying that they won't bite that. I mean, you, you have to think this lake at its widest place is three or four more miles wide. And I'm not talking about like from the back of a creek because then we're talking about like 20 miles wide and 80 miles long. Um, it varies in depth from six inches to 150 foot deep. Uh, I mean, honestly, it, there could be giants living out there in a the lake that nobody even knows that exists there. It, it, and it's so hard to believe that that exists within four hours of millions and millions of people. I mean, you have Dallas, New Orleans, Monroe. I mean, if you just look and finger out, I mean, there's so many metropolitan areas that are just right around Toledo Bend. I honestly feel like the fishing pressure on it is nil to none, especially in the summer months. I mean, you definitely can go out there in the summer and you just don't hardly see anybody. This place is really intimidating for a lot of people to get around on. It's huge and it's a solid stump field. But most of the channels are fairly well marked. There are places, you know, like right here, I mean, it's close to a half a mile between this buoy and the next one. 
but there are not a lot of turns in them. They're, you know, a lot, they're pretty straight, and, but you just really gotta pay attention because if you run out of those buoys, I guarantee you something's fixing to get torn up. There's pretty much grass in the whole area of the lake that we were in, but the deal is they're a little subtle places. In a perfect situation, you have a grass line, you want some type of channel, depression. Uh, the fish seem to be relating right now to sharper breaks. You know, they're not on that real flat, sloping type bottom. They want that grass to grow right out there and kind of fall off into the ocean. You know, just into the abyss, that black water right next to it. And what I call that black water is, is where, you know, that bottom is a real severe drop. Like it may be going, like at the grass line, it may fall from 25 to 40, 25 to 30. Those are the best. You, you need at least a five foot sheer drop. Those are the places right now that those fish are wanting to get on. You know, it wouldn't be impossible to do this without this kind of electronics, but you gotta have some kind to do it. Cause you gotta be able to stay at the depth, you know, where the, the edge of the grass, where the drop off is. And, uh, but with having my GPS on one side of the screen and having my sonar on the other, I got everything together. So I know exactly what's going on at all the time. It's like playing a video game. When I'm out here fishing in open water, regardless here or whatever I may be doing, I don't even look at my surroundings. This particular unit is antennas right here, so we are sitting right there, like where you see me on the screen at. So I can draw a line, move over 10 foot, and I can just really take a place apart by knowing exactly where I am at all times. You know, back in the day, you'd have to mark a tree and a buoy and an island and, you know, to try, you know, to figure out exactly where you are, and then you would throw a buoy. Like when I'd get bit, I'd throw a buoy. And that way, if I drifted off, I could go back to the buoy. But now with, you know, our electronics are so good that, I mean, it wouldn't matter if I'm 100 miles offshore or 100 yards. No, oh, it is. It's a better one. Now that's more like what we come for. Pretty fish, pretty fish. Millions of that size that live here. I advise everyone out there, if you get the opportunity this summer, or next summer, or the summer after that, get on over here to Toledo Bend and try some of this deep grass fishing, pad fishing, endless opportunities here at Toledo Bend. We'll see you here next time on Sportsman TV.